uh, so group three as well on the innovative approach. So best food quality goes to group three, best visualization goes to group three, and uh, innovative approach as well goes to group uh, three. Uh, for the second place, um, innovative approach, group five to, um, as that, group five, uh, is in the, in the group five, we have the Zalala We have, um, uh, we have Abraham Gesasi. We also have, uh, Beza Utala at the uh, so innovative approach for second place is uh, good five, and then there is the notable, and uh, we are recognizing some of the group members that have actually the, uh, they performed well in terms of their relation, uh, personal relationship skills, as well as um, helping the group to um, achieve excellent results. Uh, most of the submissions, or all of the submissions, were excellent, and then we we identified and noticed uh, some uh, individual contributions that makes it um, uh, excellent. For uh, group one, we have selected a team player, and then it's uh, Stashi Kibika. For uh, uh, for from the feedback that we've had with all of the group, uh, all of the groups. We, uh, Stashi Kipika stands out in terms of having, um, ex um, she exceeded the uh, uh, expectations of most of our um, group members, and then we are recognizing our, uh, our group behaviors as well as our contributions to the group. Uh, for group two, we have um, three uh, team players there. We have uh, Milky Bekele, we also have uh, Tibora Gabriel Yusalem, and then we have uh, sorry, we have Tibora Gabriel uh, Yones, sorry, and then we have Yerusalem. These are the team players for uh, group two. We have done well to create the perfect uh, solution for the uh, problem that was proposed for group four slash five. Uh, for group three. The team player for group three goes to uh, Itani Kepans and um, El and um, Elias um, and Andrew Allen. These we recognize the um, the standard uh, performance as well as the feedback that we've gotten from the team members of uh, group three. For group four, uh, the team player that was selected there is uh, Michael Daco. He showed exceptional uh, leadership ability from when the group was falling the, and then they were able to like submit something uh, tangible and concrete at the end and then um, for group five we uh, the the team player for group five is Salalam Getahon Salalam Getahon he most of the uh, uh, project updates that we had for group four he was leading it and then we were we recognize most uh, from the feedback he exceeded the uh, expectations of most of the uh, members in his group. And then for group six, uh, the team player for group six is Azaria Tamrat. And uh, this is also informed by the feedback that we've gotten from the um, group members, as well as his uh, exceptional abilities to coordinate the group, as well as carry the group in order to deliver something concrete and tangible at the end of the. Uh, project and uh, these are the five uh, winners that we have for four or slash uh, with five and then uh, we would be communicating the next video for today, Friday for week six challenge that you have just completed and I will hand over to get about to carry on this tutorial today. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, thanks, Anup Bubakar. So, do we have any question regarding like anything to be clarified, or is everything fine with respect to the, the announcement? So, but if, if you have, just probably reach out to uh, Bubakar. I think that's easier. So, I want to see hands who read the project or the challenge description 
and who thought of what, who like whatever your impression. Let's start from, you know, what needs to be filled. Like so, for me, I always look at it as like you have something, and I'm contributing into that something instead of like I'm telling you what to do. So hopefully, some of you read, some of you have questions, some of you have questions like I, this thing seems like I don't know. Tell me a little bit about the introduction. That's also a question itself. Or some people could just be a bit more specific, saying like, okay, I understand the general concept, but I don't understand this. Or uh, like, how are we gonna do that? Anything that is like related to what you read. If you haven't read, of course, it's like you also just say like, okay, I haven't read it. It's just tell me, give me an overview. Write it at least in the chat. Not now. Okay, so. I have tried to read uh, the document and uh, I have noticed some points. So one thing uh, I have seen from the starting of the document is like, uh, this is uh, different from the machine learning approach. So in the machine learning, we have a data set and we have a target, so we predict. But in this one, it's asked a different kind of question. So from my understanding, we have a different kind of approach on this. Uh, and the concept is kind of new, this uh, casual graph, which I haven't understood it yet. So I need more clarification on the casual graph and what casual is and its relationship with uh, statistics or stats, because I have seen it on somewhere. So that's what I have found so far. Great. Yeah, that's. Good. Let's hear more from people. Let's enrich it. Imagine that we are a team and we have undertaken a certain challenge and we are discussing on what it is, if we understand. So it's kind of consider use if you are in a team and a proper tips like in an industrial setting. So, okay, uh, Toyin. Hi, good morning. So I have gone through the documents, but uh, I tried to take the data from the business need. The question was, uh, what, what would uh, a change in price or something like something like what is a change in price? What effect would a change? You mean? So in which uh, part are you talking? Can you? I, I missed. Uh... Is that too? Toyin, can you repeat again? Just because I think. Is it only for me or Toyin is breaking up? I think she's breaking I will switch off my video. Oh. Okay. So in, I didn't hear you, so if you could repeat or write better. And then, okay. And uh, Mubarak, he raised first, but then we'll go to Bahugu and then uh, Mubarak and then, okay, so let me open the queue. Okay, Mubarak, go on and then Bahugu. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I've gone through the documents. And I, there is a, a research report attached to it, which I'm currently going through at the moment. So, I, I think from, from what I can understand from um, the document, I mean the research report, it's more or less like maybe you're supposed to do something like that, is, that has to do with classification or something like that. I'm not very sure. Yeah, there is a, the cash graph on there, but I think uh, there should be something related to classification to the goal of the data sets. I don't know if that perception is correct or not. But I uh, say I put you understand a little bit uh, of what we're supposed to do. That's, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Great. Yeah, now go on, Mubarak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm done, I'm done. Okay, right, great. So you, you're saying your your understanding is that causal graph something you think or you are 
you're kind of suspecting that it maybe is related to some kind of type of classification way. Is that, did I understand you? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. So, um, and that's not the case, but we'll explain. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm next. Yeah, uh, Google. Okay, so I have tried to uh, dig a little bit about causal graph, and I have, I think I have some know-how about it. So we have nodes in causal graph. Nodes are, mm, I think, the features in our data or the columns, the way I understand it. And uh, the causal graph uh, demonstrates the relationship one node has to the other. So it might be directed, which means one node might affect or influence the other node, or it might be the other way around. And this uh, link or affecting might have a chain, like A will affect B and B will affect C, and perhaps C might affect A or will not affect A, or it might be directional or it might be directionless. So uh, the causal graph analyzes this, that. Uh, which affects what and in what direction and is it is it actually uh, they affected because of the columns by themselves and not by another like feature or cause mm, that's what i understand about causal graph great i think that's a very very good start yeah i mean we will explain a little bit more in detail because it's a formal thing and but Overall, the big picture is something like that. Okay, Michael? All right, yes, I've, I've also gone through it and I've noticed that um, the causal graph is kind of a way of um, trying to um, reduce the number of features and then trying to find the effects, the, the features which are going to, which are, um, which are going to uh, be okay if you use it to predict whatever you are looking for. So uh, for me, the actual implementation of how the causal graph and all that is, is I'm, I'm actually hearing it for the first time. And um, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, will be presented to us. And then after going through a lot of the references to, I think, um, in addition to what I would hear from over here, I think it would help for me to understand <clears throat> how to put that into um, practice. Great. Um, Deborah, very good question. It is not that we will, the whole point, these are really great questions because if, if you now know that's not the case, you're not gonna waste your time, right? Thinking ah, cause, causal graph and import, feature importance. It is not, it's a different type, but, but these are the kind of questions I want to come out, like what you think or what you felt and then so that I can explain in answers specific and keep your question Deborah if you haven't understood finally uh, why it's not like oh that, that you know answering your own question right okay so who raised the hand uh, Christian yeah Christian yeah go on is your mic not working maybe Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay. I said I would like also to add that when you are talking about uh, causal graph, is also uh, a graph which display uh, some features who have a causal, a, a real causal effect on the response variables, and um, do and another and is also good also to check if other features have are playing the game of confounding. That means that at, at the beginning, maybe you, you pull up all of your, your your features in a graph and you, you think about the best, uh, if those kind of features have maybe play the role of confounding or maybe that will play the, the role of causal. And based on that, you, you will make maybe your algorithm or build your algorithm and vet if uh, your graph that you make at the beginning is, is good or not. That is what I, I want to have. 
Great. Thanks. Thanks, Christian. Um, I think he added one important part, which is confounding. And for most of you, probably, even for me, when I check these things, you know, know that not everyone knows this, this kind of concepts, right? And Christian probably he is, has, a, you know, he has a statistical background and he's probably aware of many of the details. But even for me, confounding, I know it, but within the, the feature, the name, sometimes it might be very new for, for you, but it just means some, you know, some variables that, that affect also your, your target um, or your dependent variable. So there is a much huge issue called Simpson's uh, paradox, which I will come to it, but it's a good place. And again, you know, confounding comes in way of describing it or answering or relating to this causal graph. Good, thank you, uh, Christian. And anyone else? It's like, you know, whatever you understood, whatever you misunderstood, I don't expect to, for you to understand. It's also to misunderstand so that that misunderstanding, when it's stated, it will not anymore be a misunderstanding, but a cause for understanding, which means causal. Go on, okay. Uh, so Sumanyish said, uh, Jakinda, you're next, but let me read. Uh, causal graphs are probabilistic. Graphical models used to encode assumptions about the data generating process. That's very, very good. Again, I mean, it's basically really, that's the case. Um, I think what Milky asked also probabilistic graphical models, there is one catch. It is not probability per se, or in a sense that it is, everything is probability. Probability is mathematics. Statistics is different. So in that sense, in the sense of, if you are talking about probabilistic, in the sense of that mathematics, yes. In the sense of like, uh, just the usual way you know, which is, you know, all the uh, joint probability distribution, not. So it's slightly different, but very close. So it, it, it talks about exactly, it talks about this probabilistic graphical models and data generating process it's it's in that space so the good thing is that you're, you guys are mentioning it and you're kind of zooming in which is good for some of you probably who doesn't understand i don't even also understand don't 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 feel threatened if you don't understand i don't understand many of these things probably the graphical models and all that right so but it is you don't need to understand every detail the most important part we will talk and it's about thinking and knowing and you know being careful in the future that these things exist okay so, but yes, manage that's very almost close there and um, part. Um, Jakinda? Uh, hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, based on what I've heard, because uh, I just got home and uh, I want to sit down and read it. So, uh, what I've understood is we're supposed to make a graph uh, called a, ca a casual graph that uh, shows the relationship between different the points of our data in relation to each other like uh it's a something like uh what's this uh, a tree a tree sort of graph that has a, a parent and a, and its nodes going down uh am i really on the right track or yeah, I'm missing yeah it? That, that's true so what is the main, one of the key element of this week for you you will learn about graphs graphs are powerful Graphs come everywhere from machine learning, as Jacinda was saying, in you know, decision trees, blah, blah. But graphs in SQL, these days, even APIs, uh, and almost in every uh, element, it's graph is it's like al algebra. I think some mathematicians can tell you, you can, you can represent almost everything in graphs because it's basically a type of you know, relationships, right? So, anything can be encoded in that as well. So it's type of, just like algebra, numerical algebra or something, you have also graphical uh, elements or can encode everything and you can do all type of mathematics with graphs, right? So um, it is exactly that uh, in some way, and you are supposed to exactly build a graph, but how you build the graph from the data is very key, right? Because you can build anything, as we said, but the constraints that you define and the kind of computations you do to build the graph is where, of course, this code, and also it's not casual in some way, it's like think of cause and effect, right? So however you pronounce cause, it's that cause, 
And then causal graph or causal graph is basically that cause and effect. So it's the part of that, the cause and effect, the first part, which is the cause part. So it is the graph of causation. So it's the causal graphs, right? So um, we are talking about, well, we are trying to, we are interested to go beyond, you have probably heard it many times that correlation is not causation. So this causality, trying to answer that part, trying to formally write and, you know, kind of do some mathematics around this, this central concept that correlation only, linear or nonlinear correlation, may not imply causation. And therefore, you want to write a calculus or mathematics for that to estimate what is caused by what. You know, when you see correlation, what caused it? So which, which feature? So that, that causal graph is trying to quantify relationships in your, I think many people say it, in your data. Your data has like, in this case, uh, features, um, and then also confounding means even some other thing. And then causality, unfortunately, unlike statistics, it depends, it goes one step beyond the data. So the data that you have, if you do every computation with, with the variables that are related to that observed, um, uh, uh, observed variables, that's called statistics. So that's what you're trying to understand, the data, you know, the, the, the probability distribution that generates the data. While in causality, you want to go beyond, and that is not that beyond thing is not encoded in the data. So you have to make some assumption, and, and causality relates to that assumption. Um, that you, you make. So you try to include your assumptions as part of the statistics. So when you expand statistics, you gain causality, basically. So, um, okay. So again, you know, back to you. I explain a little bit like that, and then I want to feedback and what you understand, what you don't understand. Um, by which we identify our features and finally build the model that we we'll use this as an input. Yeah, so you're creating a hierarchy, but you're creating relationships with certain assumptions added to it and then with that relationships between different features so but that different feature is not just only one to one it's multiple right it, it can be um, kind of with different operators for example it could be like x y z so you might you might create of course the first part is x related to y x related to z but x related to y given z X related to Y given, you know, so there are like also um, constraints that, that applies. So the graph that you build should include all types of information basically that is involved, so such that linearity and nonlinearity is encoded. So, yes, it is building this hierarchy, but you then that becomes the input. So, once you build a proper good graph um, or what we call causal graph, from then then there are properties that are exactly what is the most important aspect. You know, there are many concepts that defines, okay, relationships. So how are, is independence, for example. You know, in, in statistics, independence means if the mutual information or the, you know, the, the correlation between X and Y or one parameter, one feature and another feature is zero, then you say, oh, they are independent. But that beyond, in this case, when you build independence in graph, then you use like a concept called disapparation, or the, which means directional separation, and that's what we talk disapparation. And then there is in a graph there are collisions, uh, or points, nodes where you know some kind of collisions happen, and you use them as part of you know. So such complex things comes. We don't expect you to understand that that you use those type of features and those type of variables to really then finally say whether something has been caused by something else, or incorporating whether, you know, uh, the most important part of this causal graph actually is then answering questions that you cannot answer in statistics. So in statistics, you want to say like, okay, earlier someone says, I think, uh, price, I think, uh, I'm not sure who that was, but for example, you can, from a statistics, you can understand what, like, so what is the probability of A, a user A, buying a product uh, given the price was twice, right? So, you know, you can answer that. That's something called a C, 
Like that means you are seeing a variable, that means you are fixing it, conditioning it, and you are asking some question. Statistics, super probabilistic graph can answer that type of question. But then there are other type of question. What about if I do? So there's an action questions. And then there are also like some really uh, would have, if I had doubled the past tense basically, if I had doubled the price at a certain time, would the person have bought? So that kind of becomes really can only answer through causal graphs. So that's where we are talking about it policies, for example, if we had banned tobacco, I'm just giving examples that are almost always when you read the references you will get. If we if we um, banned to, you know the smoking, what would be the cancer rate? What would have been the cancer rate? So if you are trying to answer past actions with past outcomes, which are not already in the data, then you are talking about causality and you need more information because the data doesn't encode that. So that's what's called, uh, okay. So again, um, you know, a little bit explanation, but then I will give it back. So Mubarak asked, what is the end goal after finding the relationship? It is to answer uh, questions like, very simple, exactly what machine learning is trying to do sometimes, which is, you know, what would I do? Like, would the, if I do, uh, if I double my price today on my stock, how much will I lose? So that basically is one question you would ask. Or like for Amazon, they might say like, okay, if I price the Amazon instance uh, price today, you know, will the user like A, will they still use it? That's the type of questions in probabilistic case, you can only answer through conditionality, but here you have other calculus. So you, usually we call it calculus, this thing where like, you have a new degree of freedom to compute something. So the calculus of gra causal graph is what we are going to use. Okay, so uh, I will come to you, Jakinda, but Milky asked, do we create multiple model layers that handle different levels of relation hierarchy and pass on to the last layer? Don't think of it as a layer now. So this is not a layer. This you build as one, like in, in n dimension. So I think, it is important for thinking for as a form of layer, but I think the most important part is that this thing is built like basically simultaneously, you can call it. It's the relationships that, that are um, that you are forming. So it is not layer by layer, like in, in, in the sense of um, uh, decision trees. Okay, so Jakinda, you, 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 you can go and then I will try to answer after that to people who are that layer. Uh, I just wanted to ask, are we going to take the same approach like uh, the A-B testing, where we first do the uh, the causal inferences aside, and then now we compare what we have done with uh, a machine learning approach? Very good question. But the most important question from your question for me, or the most important information I got is that you are now primed to think about hypothesis testing. That's good. That's where I say, you know, that's where I would be happy to see that you are forming relations, whether conscious or unconscious, to something that is that you have already done. Yes, these things relate to exactly some, you know, uh, to call to basically the challenge that you faced in A/B testing. The challenge in A/B testing is really finding causation. But of course, we were trying in A/B testing. We were trying to use um, some other statistical models to answer that. Here we are answering a lot more of that that type of question, hypothesis and you know things through a causal graph. So what you are, I'm not so here. Given that this is much more of a data science, I we are, you. The whole point is for you to understand the problem, not provide even solution. I would be happy, and you would say, I would say you completed the. The, the this week's challenge well and excellent if you understand the complexity and that you will start thinking about how to you know different types of biases like confounding bias and some other like uh, biases that that we are going to list down so just um, you have like information bias you have multiple types of bias so those types of bias comes, bias in itself comes because you are not taking care of something. 
or the, the thing needs treatment to the bias. And those comes to exactly this. So the bias, for example, in A-B testing is that you reject the null hypothesis even if you know the data is biased or the data is not enough or something, right? So th those kind of things. But yes, but we don't, what is the most important to, to see, and also that's because uh, people ask questions also relates to that, what are the questions we will answer in our case, it is about what caused breast cancer or what, so not actually that because we don't, the data that we deal is the breast cancer, right? But what we are trying to answer is that what, like we know, we assume that the data that is given can tell us about um, breast cancer. And now we want to know which part caused or which, which features are basically uh, are relating to to that you know to that information so it is related in some way to feature importance but feature importance is answering question about the past which is basically a statistical in this case we are about the causation of it so we are trying to infer which parameters are causing or giving you the signal and then, so that basically in certain way, you can think of it as feature importance, but it's not feature importance in the sense that you know. And then you are using then a question, a very proper question saying like, okay, if, if I find a drug which shrinks, for example, the size of the cell to half of it, to half of what is observed, you know, will the outcome change? So that's the type of question you would ask now with this, with, with, or you will answer with the causal graph. Deborah, is that something clear? Because your two questions are very nice, they're related, it also relates to Jakinda, and I, I, I want to understand if you have at least clarity how it relates with feature importance and what you are trying to answer. You can also unmute. I think somehow it's good. I'm happy with somehow. Anyone else who wants to further on this extend or ask and Nathanael, can you give us an example of question we would ask on the breast cancer? Yeah, hopefully you got also Nathanael, right? An example, it would be like you take one of, let's say, the, an important parameter and we call it a do, a, do, a do task or a do action or a do parameter. What you are saying by do actions is that you are saying, okay, I am going to do something uh, yeah, it's like for a sale. So if you just read some of the reference I gave, you basically see that uh, this, uh, this, how the data is generated or some of the process, the experiments that you take, you know, through a very fine needle, the area that's considered tumor, but in this case it could be cancer or not cancer, you don't know. And most of the time, actually, it's not cancer because the body has many ways to generate those kind of things. But then you take a small sample, you put it under a microscope, and then in the microscope, you kind of make some processing so that it's bright, and then you take a picture. And then from that picture, you measure different types of things, radius of the cell, um, and, you know, many other properties that are given in the data. And then you are trying to relate whether, so you have also, because of the laboratory um, outcome, you have also a target variable. In this case, is it a cancer or not cancer, right? And therefore, from that, you are trying to relate to understand that element. So in this case, let's take just the radius of the cell, you know, that of the samples, or geometry of the cell, it could be. So in this case, then your question would be like, let's imagine I have a drug that reduces the size of these cells to a half. And what happens to um, the cancer? That's the question you want to answer. But the thing is, this is a do, like that means you actually assign a certain action to the variable and you want to see its outcome how it is influencing in a probabilistic sense it would only answer it's the most complex part is that this part the probability also will answer but the probability what does it answer probability would answer like okay what is the state you know the out the case in this case the person or whatever the user being having cancer given that the radius is two so that's called conditionality. So that is what you will answer in a statistical case. But in a causal sense, you're not answering that. That's because it's called, that's called observation. 
In a causal sense, you're, what you're answering is something else. You're answering what is the probability in that case, or what happens, if now it's not like you're not fixing it, but you're saying like, if the case had it been observed with a radius of a certain amount, half, half the radius, you're answering very different things. It sounds almost identical. It took me also some time to understand it, but it's different. Because in probability, why it's not intuitive is that these tiny differences, it's like grammar. It was like in English or in any other language that you have a grammar. If I say like, had I had a car, I would have driven, you know, to the next city. It's very different from like, I would like, you know, some kind of like, um, if I, like, well, what would be the equivalent? Yeah, if I had a car, what would I, you know, um, I have to think about that. But it's like, it would be something like one would be observational, the other one would be like that the action has been done. If the action has been done, what is the outcome? But the data tells you only we, before the action, you know, without the action. It's called like in the case of treatment, like for example, in the case of like medical treatment, you have only a sample that says whether the the person has been treated or not treated. But you cannot tell you, you cannot answer the same question like, if I didn't have the, you know, if we hadn't exposed the person to a, a treatment, what would happen? Because that data is not observed. So you might try to infer it statistically, but that the data, then you, you, you come into this confounding and other biases. So, and that's what it's trying to answer. Again, if you try, if you understand kind of at least appreciate and there might be differences, then I'm fine. But if you're like confused, I don't understand what you're saying, then ask now. Yes, I think that is very close, Deborah. Yes. But the problem is that how there is no such thing. Because the data, but it's exactly that. But the problem in what the, this causal graph tries to answer is that you haven't generated. So that differently means, how do you answer that question? It's exactly that, those kind of questions. Like, you know, if we had nature generated something else, exactly like, like that, instead of that. So it's called intervention. So when you make intervention, definitely that, for that intervention, nature generates data, but you haven't seen, you haven't generated that data, therefore, you bet you want to still answer that question. So for example, policy, Let's imagine it policy. Earlier I said smoking. So now you want to say like, what is the data exactly in the Deborah's question? What would the data look like, basically given this data, if we had uh, a policy which bans smoking? So that exactly got, becomes that kind of question. And in a normal statistical way, you don't answer it. You only answer like some, through some kind of form of you have to impose a certain condition called randomization. If the data was random, then I would say like, oh, there may be points in the data that tells me when, you know, something similar to the policy has, you know, an outcome, something, an outcome similar to a case where policy was imposed. But really, that may not be true. Like that, you know, like if, uh, if you had a, a policy that actually banned smoking, you wouldn't even have a data to collect about smokers, right? So it basically is a very different type of question. But Deborah, you are right, it's in that direction. Kumbani, if we don't have the data, how do we enter the question? And that's exactly what is exactly the, to the point that we have to make assumption. And where does, you know, it's called data plus assumption is causality. So that's why I'm saying statistics talks about variables of the data or joint descriptions of you know the variables made by the the joint this, the variables that relate to the observational data while here it's exactly it's trying to do it's like mathematics you know mathematics doesn't care you, the mathematician is not responsible to validate the assumption the only thing the mathematician is uh, required is from to derive consequences from those assumptions. 
And that's what is really that. And another example I will give is the same as if you know the Plutos. Um, so I have a note, right? If you have noticed in the same folder, I have used a note. I've taken a screenshot from a video from uh, Judy Appel, who is like basically the father of this. Um, some of the talks, I have to understand also the details. So I have, I have provided that. Uh, So this is, you know, the Plutus allegory of the cave. Most of you probably know. And it is basically what Pluto, in you know, the Greek times, what he is very, basically the principle of mathematics, you can call it, is that in this case there is a cave and there are people, so these prisoners basically consider us people, humans, right? And then what we have is this form of, um, some observations, the things that we can see. Because we are in a cave or in a pri we are prisoners, we are unable to see the reality, nature itself, the reality, you know, be, that generates this. So what we, in, what we have is an observation of what we see, which is projected on the wall of the, you know, the cave. Now, from that, so in this case, for example, yeah, the projected ones through light is at about you know, tables and whatever. So if you, of course, you, you can have like, you can have assumptions about what the universe could have been. Like in this case, your universe is the outside world that you might assume, or oh, there may be light, and which because you know light, and then maybe you may assume that there are three dimensions instead of two dimensions. And then it's the light that is being casted from outside that is giving you such things. But those are assumptions, right? So you are not, observing them because they are outside your box but those assumptions when they are incorporated they can be tested by the observational data the observational data plus the assumption can validate or can give you something very useful statistics okay and earlier what i was exactly saying if you look at this note is this is i think again uh, some of you probably have answered this is a traditional statistical inference paradigm you have a data you have a joint distribution that is derived by variables from the data. And then you look at the aspect of that joint distribution by taking the mean, you know, blah, blah, everything. And then you infer about, about um, from the data, you infer about the joint distribution, right? Uh, for example, in that case, yeah, like the joint distribution contains the customer's full distribution. Therefore, you can say, you know, you can infer whether the customer will buy or not, you know, if you do something, if, if you condition it on a certain way. So that's basically it. While in this new, the causal analysis part, what you have is it that you have that, but you're also asking this change, in this case, is our assumption. You know, the assumption or basically called intervention. So that intervention comes as a form of equation. So you would say, or the do action, for example, would be like, what if, if I cut, you know, if I cut something, or what if, like, if I had a policy? So those are kind of chains. And when you make that change, it's exactly as Deborah says, you just, you create some other joint distribution for P prime that is basically incorporates this change plus the, the type of the distribution. So you have another distribution for P prime. And unlike before, what you want to answer now is from this P prime instead of P. And I know for some of you, you might be very, it might still be confusing, but those two are different. Okay. So let me stop there and go back to again question and answer. So, okay. Uh, if you don't have the data, how do we answer the question? I'm, I'm sure uh, exactly this is where causality comes in from Bani, absolutely right on. Um, and Milky, how does the model accommodate that? Like, how can we make our model answer of generate predictions to different inputs? Hopefully, Milky did it answer. Did, maybe just ask the question because I am reading is okay, but if you ask it, you uh, will be much richer. Yeah, go on. I, I was kind of uh, away. I, I got disconnected and, uh, and I didn't hear my answer to the previous questions. That's why I asked this question. Okay. So, uh, but from the explanations you got so far? 
Can you say so, it, your understanding? So uh, um, I'm guessing here, but we don't need you know, data. Guess so, all we need now. so okay. So we don't need uh, data to predict or to to yeah to predict what will happen if we change something. One of the factors, I mean. So no, the data will help you generate basically the cause of that. Okay. Now the assumption that you would have together with the graph and then with the new calculus will give you some answer. So of course you are basing exactly that what I was showing is so that's the part where it needs to be clear. So this one, before, we were just basically answering the statistics talks about all about this. You have a joint distribution from the data and you answer about that, that part. Now, this is kind of calling the causal graph that you're generating before asking, before any intervention. So it's called everything you ask that is not made through or cannot be answered using variables of the data or observation is called a change you know basically you have you know you're introducing some things that are not uh, that cannot be answered by the joint distribution of the data variables and therefore this thing from the causal graphs consider it this one as like allah you created this causal graph but then together with the assumption and that basically comes as a form of and then also the equation then you create some new graph basically but that new graph now contains your change so in that to see what kind of change that would be so like let me go to one of them so this is it so let's say this is an example sing versus print so this is basically what you generate from a data if you have a data that is like there's a sprinkler season rain weight right so of course it's a season you know the season depends if it rains as well as also sprinkler that's kind of like you know a different type of but if there's a season let's say if it rains then it's wet but also if you go the other way around sprinkler you know it's a season if it's like summer for example and then you have sprinkler it's wet you know then it's slippery like let's say outcome variable now so this is what the kind of from the data you build of course building this is important because if you have enough data you build this thing better like this rotation of this graph, your first joint distribution will have more information, it's better. If you have very small data, bias data, whatever, this is problematic. But now, what you are trying to do is that when you say do action, you are saying like, okay, I am saying the sprinkler on. That means like I say it myself, the sprinkler on. Which basically means now you are cutting season dependence because that's what's called the new calculus. So I'm talking in a very qualitative way, but this is this is the mathematical way this is described here. When the sprinkler is on, you get some you know new distributions, basically. So that's the change, the full distribution changed to a new type of distribution where and that is the case, and now you try to answer from that. And this is an, a type of operator that you applied, and therefore you know, it will give you, it has its own consequences in the graph, blah, blah, so that's a little bit complex, but now you're trying to answer with this graph. So this was the before, but now with your assumption class, with your operation or question, or that basically means intervention. So this in, in general is called intervention. And with that intervention, you answer. But the reason is because intervention is, anything like it could be the price you want as a company you want to increase the price or you want to decrease the price or as a salesperson you want to have offer like you did it for example for roseman you want to say like okay, what if if i had given uh, a bonus or if i had given um you know discount so those kind of questions cannot be answered here but they can be answered because they are type of do actions right so then you try to answer from this based on its own, you know, based on some graphical things. And the most important part is how you cut here. It's a very simple example because you just cut it. But how you cut is very complex in a complex graph. And, and the do option, the do operator needs to take care of everything to apply that, that 
this very, you know, to create a new graph. So the new graph is created by the calculus of causal mathematics, causal analysis. That clear? And I, yeah. because I was not being able to see. Okay. So anything that is like, you know, right now, all I need is not a very deep understanding, but at least not like getting lost. Because I want you to start from not getting lost. And then everything will start making sense. The documents, the references I gave you, the talks, whatever, will allow you to appreciate it. But at least you should be in a step right now to not be totally lost and to get a sense, somewhat picture. And then you will build on top of that. Okay? Uh, so if anyone... Can I ask one more question? Oh. Uh, yeah. In respect to modeling, can you explain a little bit more? Okay. So first, let me answer Barakat's question. So, exactly. Very, because this, the reason why I put that one is very intentional. The reason is, it's because, like, when you think of statistics and whatever I said before, really has one principle. Anything that you're trying to, to invent data, unless you, you really use a rigorous mathematics, and then you treat it that way, so it's not about reality, it's just to improve. So causality is to improve, but it doesn't still, you know, the reality is detect you, the reality you haven't observed, it's your own assumption. But the only thing is that we have seen mathematics being useful. And mathematics is not science, you know. Mathematics is pure game. You, in, you have some assumption, and you have some type of logic, and you consistently drive consequences. And no one is gonna then, if you, as long as you do that, no one is going to ask you to say, you know, the validity of your assumptions. But the validity of your assumptions are asked in science, because science is all about, even the assumptions must come from data. It's a data-driven thing. That's why even the hypothesis comes in, that's what's called science. Mathematics is not science. You don't need that. You only need logical operations and consistency and, you know, like basically all that kind of things. So. And here, causality is also admitting you cannot do, you cannot see, just like in a cave, you are in a prisoner, you are unable to see what, who does what outside. And all you can is observe something, invent, have some of assumptions, like about the outside world, incorporate the two and invent some way such that you are able to uh, infer about, basically do some inference, causal inference. And that hopefully will improve over something just purely looking at like the calculus of the shadows. So the calculus of the shadows, consider them being, in this case, uh, is the basically statistics. But if you incorporate and have a bigger calculus, which incorporates also your assumptions about the data generating process, which means the people outside or whoever is outside, and incorporate it and have, then that becomes causality. Does that answer very clearly your, your question? Hopefully, yes, I, I don't see. Okay, and then someone asked, uh, I will come to you, uh, Milky, but someone asked the column. Um, the column ID, it's basically just ID, like it's a unique identifier of, it's basically considered in this case as instance, right? So in the causal sense, it's basically, it's, it's a user. And if you have intervened, you know, if you have done some experimental that user, let's say if it's a clinical test, you might say, okay, I, I have done, you know, I have injected this person water versus, but if you have injected water, now, all the data that you have is that the person was injected water and you cannot, you don't have, you know, so that's a case. So the person itself is a case or, and therefore you'll only have one, either the treatment or any, you know, uh, basically a part of the data, part of the universe. You cannot have both. In many of the things, you cannot have the, per the same person at the same time with the same condition having both of them at the same time. That's our, that's what the problem of statistics and therefore statistics they say it's like okay because i cannot do that i'm gonna fill the gap by collecting many more and that in that many more 
then you it assumes like oh they are uniform and then this is called confounding whatever counts but what if in a certain dimension they are not the same let's say in education they are not the same in gender they are not the same in age they are not the same there are many things and then if you of course incorporate everything then all the signal will go away and that's called the simpson's paradox simpson paradox it's basically another way so the simpson paradox is basically just saying you know if you have the data you think like all are uniform but you'll always find one variable if you treat it along that dimension you know if you had let's say everything was uniform and all the data that it collects was this blue and red then the actual correlation was this the dash 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 dot but if you really are now pedantic and you want to falsify this thing you can always find a variable along which this thing will be very different and therefore you will you will infer a completely different uh, inference and this is just a general theorem that unless you really minimize you know select the confounding factors if you include all confounding factors including the universe and god itself or whatever you have then you always can reject your inference because the signal will dilute and that's called to to avoid that you cannot assume everything right you cannot treat everything so that's the balance the trade-off happens um, in this in this calculus basically okay i hope that so id basically in that just simply it's just the case like the case like the uh, the person who has been yeah for, for for that data comes from in this case not the person but the image so the image from which the different columns are derived. So, Barakat again asked, we're going to, so maybe Barakat, can you answer, ask the question um, unmuted so that it gets richer? Yeah, uh, like, if I, I get you in a clear way, uh, so we are, are we going to add our own feature to the data and figure out uh, no. what will happen? To no, it's a question yeah. we had. It's a question. Huh? We build the graph from the data, yeah. and then we ask a question. So what we add is the question and the assumption. So the assumption right. is the assumption is created by the calculus. That is basically you know what is written in all the theorems that are derived in how to compute causal graphs. So that's like that's why it's not a normal graph. It's a causal graph because this is a causal graph, and the operations that will happen is very different. Um, you know the terminologies, the nodes, how they are kind of. You know, there are many things that you, you, you say the backdoor criterion or the disapparation and all that you compute on a causal graph, you compute it differently. And then you ask, so basically what you have is operators. So your question translates into operators, which says like, for example, earlier I showed um, one operator that basically does. Um, so for example, here's another impact uh, actually about if warm-up cause injury right so this is a, from a paper proper paper that, that does causal graphs the data was collected and after the data so all of these are basically features uh, on the data so in your case 30 something features right so and then what the data what you collect generates this causal graph and basically your questions are doing so this is basically fatigue, and this is basically tissue weakness, for example, or uh, contact sport, whatever, is some, some features. But you ask some kind of do action. Like you say like, okay, if I had, if I had a warm up, like something, if a person had a warm up, does this cause something, sorry. And that would, you basically, the operator, so that's basically you answer it, so in that way, if I look, that's not the case, maybe it's just this one. So here in one of the um, introductory uh, notebook, starter notebook we gave you, so this is basically what I, I showed you, sprinkler, rain, whatever. And the do action, basically, you call it sprinkler do rain. So that basically then the, the graph is updated according to this operator. It's called the do operator. And in, in figure and in, in terminology wise, like you know, and then you basically can drive now 
what happens like you know you, you can consequences then what determines let's say if your question was uh, if if it if it had rained it was it slippery like was sprinkler important um, then now sprinkler is also important rain is important but then it is weight but because of this maybe the graph like the computation will say like no it doesn't matter because there is also another source maybe and therefore it's slippery and something like that you know, I mean, I'm just making that now so this is very um, part so and then again you know many questions you can ask um, but I'm just gonna come to to this point so these are operators that you apply on a graph and the assumption which is basically the code inside inside this thing inside uh, you know like this causal graph model where the calculus is incorporated already you know the operators whatever are are there and you call the operators and you derive basically then you derive um, some inference so so I, I am not sure if, if it is very clear but what I am saying is that you you are adding questions in the form of operators and then you are basically the assumptions whatever is treated in the form of the calculus itself so the assumptions and you know you have a way to to build so how you build the graph is also your assumption so basically how things are related how you compute correlations and all that will come into building the first graph plus the assumption which is like how operators whatever the mathematics work is basically assumptions and then the question basically the intervention will give you and then once you have the joint you know once you have this new updated graph again is back it's very similar to this what i was showing so you basically you went from here you know so you basically created now this p prime because of you updated everything so you intervene in this case you set the spring the sprinkler on so that means you have introduced some intervention and then you create a new graph and then from that you derive just like any other statistics you derive many things so from that on it can be machine learning it can be anything right just on that graph is that clear and so unmute it because now the disk the discussion is getting slightly interesting, so it would be nice to add more rich context. So, is that clear, Barakat? Yeah, uh, I've got some insights. Exactly. So All you like, need is that. As long as you are, yeah. you sense that, yeah, it makes sense. I'm not totally lost. Then I, that's all I want at this point. Yeah. So, like, let me phrase it. And if, like, I have, like, from the pictures, from the data that I have have so many features and I will try to have a graph uh, this yes. causal graph and then uh, like uh, there is a door or, or an, op an operator that will tweak or change uh, like some of the features in that column mm -hmm. and I will try to figure out what will would happen if that was something like that or yes. like... so I think here all because we have as you can see the number of tasks to this week are very simple, right? It's very, I mean, we, like, we don't ask you so much things because already understanding graph is very complex. But we want you to understand causal graph. That's where we stopped. Even if all, all our interest, a lot more is, you know, uh, interested in these three. So these three are basically what one can do. So, so, if we gave you a graph, then it, this is what we would have asked you. And it's simple. As we said, it's coded already. So, you know, uh, you would have just performed exactly what I showed you do, you know, back prop, like, uh, you know, apply this back prop and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, kind of get, as I said, that's just. And another part is to infer the causal graph from observation data and validate the graph. So this is, we chose this to be the most the point for this week's tutorial right so that's why we don't ask you much more than that like of course we really would like if you just go to the next one 
do some learning with causal inference. What is learning in this case? As I said, ask some questions like what if, you know, uh, learn how to ask the questions in the form of through this new updated causal graph, through the operators. So changing, you know, making a very actual hypothesis from looking at the graph, you would say like, what if I do that? Or like as a client, you become as a client and, or you ask the client, okay, what do you want to achieve? In this case, it's like, that's another reference I gave you, um, which is this one. You know, they have done like computations using machine learning. So there are two references I gave. One is that one, and the other one you could look at is, so this one, uh, analyze of breast cancer detection using different machine learning techniques. So there, for example, the, all they do is mostly just by doing some pre-processing, they were trying, they improved the detection, right? Now you, you can compare with that versus whatever they find, you can take it as like, you know, if I do that, or if I something apply this and apply that, what would I get? So you try to answer questions like, as um, a doctor, it could be. Like, if you say like, if I have observed, if I had observed uh, uh, an image where the size of the uh, cell is two quarter of something or some amount, you know, what is the outcome? And, and those are kind of called machine learning, uh, doing machine learning on this graph. So that the third part, in this one, we didn't ask you intentionally because already doing this and understanding the concept is hard or slightly like trickier. You need to read and understand. And the second part is inferring the causal graph is already you know complex enough and it's good. And the third one is, of course, if you have time, if you understand it, good. But we, we stop all the tasks we ask you just is only on the second point, such that you, are, you have clarity. And that's why by the end of this week, if you had really understood the problem and how all these different term, terms of bias, confounding um, information bias, this type of bias, that type of bias, if you understand where they come from, then all your life from here on, you will benefit from that understanding. You may not, know, you may not even need to do any causal inference, but that understanding that all statistics comes in, there is reality that generates the data, and the observation, and our questions sometimes are, we're actually fooling ourselves, because sometimes if we ask questions that are causal, the statistics cannot answer. So that's why it's very important to really distinguish that one, like what is statistically answerable questions and what are statistically unanswerable? What are questions that are statistical and what are questions that are causal? Again, in, you know, if you just watch some of the videos by, like we, we give as a reference, you will understand those questions that involve variables that are not observed, they are causal. And therefore, those type of questions, you, you should probably answer them through a causal analysis. Or change the question. Because if you do that, then all of your analysis become useful. So then you will not have like, you know, infer something that you would say that this is significant and it, it won't be any, you know, will not have issue. If you do some kind of, you know, uh, cell prediction, if you've done this analysis well, then you will know that you are more likely your your prediction will work more likely because you have asked it only the right question and you know the limitation of your analysis. So this goes anywhere, everywhere in your life, basically, that you would apply, um, whether machine learning, AI, or statistical things, anything that you do. And that's why we bring it here, because if you have that understanding, what we ask is that understanding and appreciation to that, it will permit all part of your thinking. And that basically means you're going to be very productive. All your works with this mindset will become much better or you will have performance, better performance than without. So your time now. I think we are over time now, right? So I will stop here, but if you have any burning, what I want exactly clear, right? So you know, there are three questions that were listed in the business context. We we'll ask you only the two, which is to create causal graph, the main element, and then to just basically do some, uh, you know, operations. Do like the type of operations we can get. You have to start the code, 
Uh, but then the most important part you have to do is that reviewing and understanding and distinguishing between this, what, are, what is causal and what is not causal and graph. Understanding and you know, learning about anything graph will help you in every other aspect. So that's the ask for this week, right? So you have to deliver a lot more on that thinking, on that understanding. If you have missed all of your statistical classes or if you didn't have a statistical class, this is your best place to really understand the foundation of statistics, basically. So I will stop there. And any questions that is kind of coming, even after we leave here, post it, and we'll get back to that. So the reference is like, I think in the first reference in the Git blah blah thing is the one I showed you, the starter code. I think all the starter code is probably provided somewhere else, but the, the reference is there. Okay, any one burning question or anyone would like to say something? That's nice, yeah. Okay, uh, from your explanation, uh, I could say I could determine what kind of questions are statistical or causal uh, questions uh, because statistical are questions are on the columns or on the features we have, but uh, the causal are on no, 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 no. what we don't have. No, 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 no. It is very different from that. That is very simplification that's absolutely not right. We say variables. When we say variables of observation, it doesn't mean the columns. It's very different. You can derive so many variables that are from those columns, that are not in those columns. So all of those involved in that. So it's not just only the, you know, that's called embedding. The data is embedded in a certain form, right? So anything that's derived from that is, it's called embedding is a very different, in, in, so machine learning doesn't embed, AI embeds. So if you want a distinction, so statistics, you get a columns and you do on those columns and you have to, the, the data is already embedded in a certain format, in a grid basically, in those dimensions. And you have to do pre-processing and feature engineering to change it into a new type of um, feature. For example, for the sake of the um, speech to text, the data was audio. Some of you created some kind of like, M, uh, like uh, some spectrograms and you do something. So you did, you know, embedding, basically. You embedded the data now from its original embedding to a new embedding, a new dimension, new format. But again, that embedding comes from the same observational data. That's still, we call it observational variables. Still they embedded, the new types are embedded. So still, as long as it's the case, you still are, are core variables, you know, that are uh, distribution or the joint distribution on observed variables. But then there are some questions that you cannot embed like that. That's slightly different. So, so embedding means transforming one form of something into another? You can, that's the simplest way of thinking, yeah. But embedding means like, why, why is de deep learning embedding? You know, why, why is deep learning powerful? Because it doesn't, it, it can, embed itself, it can change the embedding of the data because what does it do? It looks at smaller filters and features and kind of try to be generic, generically embed instead of how the data is given to it. While machine learning, for example, boosting, will take whatever you give it and it will only operate along those dimensions, right? It's like by building, I don't know, thing, graphs and something like that on the features. So it, you have to give it an embedded data. That means it is not as powerful sometimes, but deep learning with the right tool, of course, embedding is also a cost. So if you have a small data and you try to do embedding class inference, it gets like, you know, that's why deep learning is very data intensive. So I know that I'm, you know, this is very, very, embedding is in its own like field. Um, uh, because this is also another mathematics, mathematical concept. How, what is embedding? Like, you know, what is like the, um, the manifolds and all that part? And it's not just a simple transformation only, but it's a general framework. But yes, for a simple, you can say 
if you cast the data in a certain way, for example, a sound into a figure, you are embedding it. You are embedding from you know, a certain one-dimensional time versus frequency to a two-dimension pixel color. That's a different type of embedding. And there are infinite type of embedding, like in that embedding space, you have infinite time points, and each of them represent one type of embedding. And so handling all that, you know, mathematically is slightly complex, but for practical purposes, that understanding will get you somewhere. Okay. Great. Okay. So, Milky. Okay. One last. Thing. Uh, yeah, like on the embedding part, uh, I'm kind of confused. Are we changing the future's uh, characteristics, like if there is a ray uh, or not? Like I'm, I'm thinking that way. Uh, as the example you have given us earlier, but so, not changing the entire, uh, changing the entire uh, future into another format like embedding. Yeah, in this case, no. So that's what I was. I think you were like. What I was saying is that distinguishing a question whether it is causal or uh, statistical is not that simple as like. Oh, if it is described by the columns, then it is statistical if not causal it's only for that because any embedding that's just that is derived from the observation variables are also just variables of the, the data so it's only with, with that for that part for your of course for your uh, causal graph generation you don't need to do anything you, you will work on you may do some feature engineering but that's it and then after that, you will just continue with those features and you don't need to transform. If you want to transform, transform it. It's fine. Before building causal graph, you can do anything. You can do just like any other machine learning. You can feel the missing values and all that and all that and all that. Everything just that standard EDM. Okay. After that, just like you build a model, you build a causal graph. And then after that, you operate on that causal graph. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, it basically is exactly that. The, the data that you see or any observation, it's basically, you know, one outcome. And to really answer about reality, so if you want to answer about data, statistics is enough, you know. But if you want to answer about reality, then it's different. You need, you need assumptions. And those assumptions, they could be intelligent to so causal graph, or they could just be something else. But the causal graph incorporates that, the new calculus to ask that way. So hopefully, I think the details, as I said, you will understand them. You may not understand them, you may not need them, but the appreciation to the distinctions will is what I am thinking you will benefit throughout your career by understanding these tiny difference biases and you know. Uh, all the complexity that comes with causality. Because causality is exactly statistics and all machine learning, all the AI, or whatever, makes sense if there is some form of causality. It's not random chance, right? That something causes something. And that part, just that causality, all this weak stuff, is focusing you on that element so that you can appreciate the complexity and detail of that. And all we ask you is to then learn through that skill called graph, operating on graph, and knowing graph, skill on building, you know, transforming any data into a graph. That's, in this case, causal graph. It could have been just another graph. And then, um, stuff. and then when you do that, you know, you will get used to the, how do you build, how do you translate something, and, or uh, data, an image to a graph, you know, so that you will just relate, you know, you will, you will read and understand that. That part you don't know yet, but you will know by the end of, this week, and then learning and getting getting used to a graphical data or graph real data is useful because many things that you will encounter will be graph data, including HTML is a graph, right? So if you represent it, uh, you know the whole website is a graph. Everything is a graph. So data are like if they are coming from multiple sources, you know they are. So everything is a graph. You will operate on graph things. So learning that skill is important. So on top of this statistical concept you learn about a new type of format. So last week you learned about satellite image, 
the week before, you learned about this and that type of tables and in, in speech, basically. And the week before, some tab tabular. This week, you learn about graph graphical data. With that, you cover basically almost, you know, many types. So image, because you have done them. Let's imagine that you have handled them. Twitter, that's unstructured. Again, JSON data, which is more of a graph, but not presented as a graph, but now here you compute it as a graph. So basically with that, you cover all types of data types, which is important as a data engineer, you know, to understand data formats. So on top of, you know, the statistical whatever concepts are you okay. Okay, so let's stop there. And all questions then directed to Rocket Chat after this end discussions. Cheers, guys. Bye.